sec. There we go. And once again, I'd like to welcome everyone to the LA Burgers webinar for March 21st. And tonight we are going to have a great program. But before we get there, I just want to thank you. If you're a member of Lab Los Angeles Burgers, thank you very much. We really, really appreciate your support and we count on your support. We have to pay for things like computers. <laughs> no, no, we don't pay for computers, but we do pay for Zoom and we do pay for our mailbox and things like that. So there are lots of costs involved. So we appreciate your support very, very much. Thank you very much. And um, let's move on to the next slide. And tonight we have a great program that's, um, but I'm going to turn it over to John Feenstra, a board member of Los Angeles Burgers to introduce our speaker for tonight, John. Well, all right. Um, so I've known Dave, our Dave Brexta, our speaker tonight for more than 20 years now. Uh, and we met in California, even though we're both uh, natives of the, uh, the, the great angry state of New Jersey. Um, <laughs> Dave is uh, currently, uh, a, he's, well, he's always been a biologist, but he's currently a biologist with the uh, Bureau, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, um, in, in which he works uh, as a, um, uh, uh, doing, doing analysis of uh, the effects of uh, offshore and oceanic uh, energy projects on, uh, on, on birds in the uh, Pacific Ocean. So before that, he worked uh, as an endangered species biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, he's been doing pelagic trips for 30 years. Uh, he, after his first one, he has never gone back uh, to, to, uh, to, well, he's done other kinds of birding, but uh, pelagic birding remains his favorite. And uh, he's been out there on numbers of trips uh, off the Pacific and the Atlantic, off of uh, East Asia, the uh, the Russian coast, and uh, has has traveled the world to uh, to see and study seabirds. So, uh, and I, as I said, I've known Dave a long time. He's a good friend, and I know he's going to give us a great talk on Elsets tonight. So, uh, yep, yeah, do it, man. Thanks so much. Let me try sharing my screen here and see if this works. Just need a couple awkward steps here and then we'll get going. And are people seeing my presenter view or full slides? No, you're full slide, you're all set. Okay, perfect. So I can cheat here on the side. Yeah, well, thanks for that intro, John. Um, yeah, thanks for having me tonight. Um, I'm glad you all think this is gonna be a great talk because uh, <laughs> nobody's, seen it yet it's like the great guitarist Jeff Beck used to say he was always offended when people clapped before he played anything but um no, I, I I do spend a lot of time thinking about seabirds looking at seabirds and I have to say that one of my favorite families of birds um are the alcids so I was really uh, excited when I got the offer to to do this talk tonight so you know I always like talking in person I mean, webinars have become like sort of a necessary evil lately with uh, all the crazy things going on in the world. Because uh, I like to be interactive. I like to see people's faces when I make bad jokes or whatever. But, uh, you know, we'll we'll hope that what's going on behind the screen, that, that you're enjoying it. But, you know, since it is different, I will say, you know, you can do things that you don't normally do at an in-person talk. So, you know, you can grab a bowl of cereal, um, make sure you're on mute. Maybe, you know, you want to have a nice, um, you know, frosty uh, malted beverage. You could pick one of those. Or, you know, maybe you just want to cuddle up with someone special. Um, but, yeah, you could do any or all of those three things and, and yeah, settle in for this talk tonight, which will be an overview of, of alcids in Southern California. Um, and I've certainly traveled around the world, like John said, kind of looking at seabirds and, and alcids. Um, so I'm gonna share a lot of photos from those journeys. And in the beginning here, I'm gonna talk just about sort of alcids in general and what makes them cool and special. And then we'll get into the Southern California specific stuff. So, you know, I may share some, you know, some, photos from other parts of the world that aren't necessarily um, 
pertinent to our identification challenges here, but it'll be fun to look at some of those. And, and also, you know, I do work for the government and we have to be very particular about making sure that things that we present are sensitive to people with uh, challenges, you know, or disabilities, you know, and so I want to just say in advance that I apologize if you're black, white, brown, gray, blue, colorblind, you're going to have a tough time with this because I think they're the only five colors in this program. So yeah, just starting out, here's a map showing the world distribution of all ALCIDs. So they are a Northern Hemisphere species uh, or family, I should say, um, and spread across circumpolarly um, across the top of the world. Um, and global diversity, if you look at this map, um, gives a, a little idea of, of where the diversity of the different species occurs. And if you kind of zoom in on that, getting rid of the southern part of the world, you can see along the Pacific coast and up in Alaska and the Russian Far East has the greatest diversity of alcids in the world, really meaning the most uh, number of, of species. So there's 24 species of alcids in the world, depending what taxonomy you go by, but right now, 24. I've been fortunate enough to see 23 of those, um, 22 of which occur in North America. Uh, two of them have a real circumpolar distribution, the common myrrh and thick-billed myrrh sort of occur around the top of the world. Uh, there's two endemic to the North Atlantic, the Atlantic puffin and the razorbill. Two others that just barely occur in the Pacific, but are largely Atlantic, the dovekey and black guillemot. And then the remaining 16 alcids are endemic to the Pacific. Um, so uh, we are in a great part of the world here in Southern California and in places that we can get to, to the north of us to, to observe and, and enjoy alcids. Um, and then I do have to say uh, that there is one extinct alcid and we're just gonna at least acknowledge that. Uh, the great auk here on the bottom right of this plate of extinct birds by Roger Tory Peterson. Um, yeah, and this was a flightless species that was wiped out by hunting in the early 1800s. The last confirmed records of that species were off Newfoundland in the 1830s and Iceland in 1844. But this really was like the pelagic passenger pigeon, which the passenger pigeons up at the top of that plate on the right side. But, you know, a really incredibly abundant bird that uh, mankind wiped off the face of the earth um, in a pretty short amount of time. And as someone who works in ELSID conservation, you know, it's a, things that we remember and, and lessons that we've learned. Um, so there's three subfamilies of ELSIDs, and I'll apologize in advance if I butcher the Latin here, but the ELSINAE, which are guillemots, merlets, and mers, the aethiinae, the auklets, and the fraterculinae, the puffins. Um, and so these, there's three main types based on appearance and diet. So the mers, guillemots, and merlets are slender build fish eating species. The um, puffins and rhinoceros auklet are deep build fish eating species. And, and then the stubby build plankton eaters there in the middle are the small auklets. And so these are also the um, Northern hemisphere equivalent of penguins um, in a classic case of convergent evolution of unrelated taxa. So, both uh, very similar and they fly underwater and, and you know their their lives are, are very similar with with penguins but not related in any way to penguins so they uh, evolved kind of along similar lines in different parts of the world um, so most are colonial nesters but will still defend a nest site within a colony many nest on cliff and rock ledges like these thick-billed murres in the russian far east um, and in general, alcids are highly pelagic and they come to land just to breed and, and spend the rest of their time at sea. Um, and they can be very abundant at sea near colonies like this mixture of common and thick-billed mers. When you have these big, huge colonies of birds, you can see loads of them at sea. But other species can nest in a real solitary fashion, excuse me, the Brachyramphus merlets are very solitary 
and will nest in either a crevice, a uh, scrape on the ground or the tundra, or on ancient tree branches. And this tree here is, is a special tree. So this, if you see in the middle of that tree, like in a right dead center of the frame, there's like a little bright patch on the tree. That's actually a plaque. So this tree is where the first marbled merlet nest was discovered. Um, and that was up in Santa Cruz County. And so when they found that nest, and I believe it was a logger up there that found the nest on, uh, on a branch in 1974, that was the last U.S. bird to have its nest discovered. And so this is the, the tree where the first marbled merlet nest was discovered. Um, yeah, and many of these, the Brachyrhamphus merlets are very precocial, and they'll take their chicks to sea soon after hatching, some within one to two days, like this ancient merlet did. Um, and it's thought that actually ancient merlets spend the least amount of time on land of any bird in the world, which I never knew that before, but thought that was interesting. Part of the fascinating world of alcids. Oops, I think I skipped the picture. Um, so in general, Alcids like this whiskered auklet have real compact muscular bodies with short wings, tails, and legs. They all have a real similar build. Um, they fly rapidly about 35 to 50 miles an hour close to the sea surface with whirring wing beats. And, and they also, like penguins, use their wings for underwater propulsion, unlike other swimming vertebrates. A lot of the other Swimming birds like cormorants, when they dive, will propel themselves with their feet, and most diving birds do that. Um, and so uh, alcids will sort of hold their wings partially extended underwater to reduce drag. And, and some of the species, the larger species, are deep diving and have been at depths of three to 600 feet. Um, and because of this lifestyle, they have very dense waterproof plumage and strong bones that can resist crushing water pressures. Um, and their tissues also have enhanced oxygen storing capabilities for those deep dives. Another thing that I find fascinating about alcids is they have more variation in bill shape and structure and use than any other family of North American birds. Um, and these shapes affect their foraging and, and also elaborate ornamentation during the breeding season. And sort of going across the top here, um, you know, puffins have deep laterally compressed bills like that tufted puffin on the left. Rhinoceros auklet develops that horny growth at the base of its bill during the breeding season. Next to that, to the right, is a um, parakeet auklet, which uses that upward hooked lower jaw to capture jellyfish, a real sort of unique uh, foraging adaptation there. Then going to the bottom left, the crested auklet has a short stubby bill like other auklets, but develops these horny plates on it during the breeding season. The ancient merlet there in the middle bottom has a small laterally compressed bill. And then to the right, like that uh, lovely spectacled guillemot, uh, mers, guillemots, and merlets have dagger-shaped bills. So really interesting um, diversity within the family. And, and I chose these six because actually David Sibley had an illustration in one of his books that showed this. And I chose those same six birds. But you could just put almost every alcid up and, and all of them have slightly different uh, bills. It's really interesting. Um, and most are countershaded for life at sea, but species like marbled kitlitzes and long-billed merlet are cryptic while breeding because they're on exposed ground or in trees, but then will transition to a black and white plumage during a non-breeding season when at sea. So they're like the ptarmigans of the sea, like these marbled merlets here. So the bird on the, the left is a basic plumage bird and, and the bird on the right there that photo that Todd provided me um, is a, a alternate plumage bird during the breeding season. Um, so a lot of the smaller ones like these crested auklets are often active at night and um, at colonies to avoid diurnal predators. So these small birds have to come in either you know at dusk or under the cloak of darkness because of predation pressures. And I've been at places in Russia where you can see you know, one spot millions of birds coming in at, at dusk to these colonies, which is pretty spectacular. And they'll often aggregate uh, at sea right before some of these mass movements in. And then here was actually one of the more incredible moments I've had in my life, a night where 
we estimated we had 10 million birds coming into an island that's about half the size of San Miguel. Um, yeah, six million least auklets maybe, and and several million of, of other alcids and other birds. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty incredible. But a good time to mention conservation issues. This was an island that I was told maybe only 300 people have ever even seen this island off the coast of Russia. Uh, but where man has had a greater touch on islands, we've created a lot of issues for alcids, including introduced predators on their breeding islands, uh, fishery impacts around islands and in, in their pelagic environment, especially gill nets. Uh, artificial lighting is an issue. Hunting, at least formerly, even though John Feenstrick can tell you how good a common myrrh tastes. Um, oil spills are certainly an issue and climate change. And then also now even energy development. Some of the things I'm working on with wind energy could have potential impacts to alcids. Um, you know, but they are among some of the most wanted birds for bird watchers. And, and maybe it's part of, uh, you know, just kind of their fascinating lifestyle and, and how beautiful some of these birds are, but they're in difficult places. You have to generally get to see to see them. They breed in the north and remote places. And, and I remember there was a book years ago, um, I think it was Stephen Mladenov and Mark O'Brien wrote America's Most Wanted Birds. And it was the 100 most wanted birds in the lower 48. And and six of those hundred birds were, were alcids. Um, if anyone could guess what, what those are, you know, Ron will give you extra points for that um, on top of the fairy thrush. Uh, but then I include this here, the whiskered auklet, because I think arguably the whisker, whiskered auklet is one of the most wanted birds in the world and only occurs in some, some very remote places. But alcids don't make it easy on us, right? And, and that's kind of why I'm giving this talk. I mean, in, in some ways, you might look at them in a book and go, well, you know, geez, they're, a lot of them are fairly unmistakable. You know, what's the problem? But if I called out a rhinoceros auklet on a pelagic trip at one o'clock and you looked and, and you saw this, right? Or or what if we said, oh, here's a Guadalupe merlet, but when you look, there's the back of a head or or we call out a Scripps's merlet and by the time you look, maybe only the head is visible above the swell, or maybe nothing is visible above the swell. Um, or possibly, you know, when we call out a bird on the PA and we scare it away like this Carveri's Merlet, it's, it's gone. And so, you know, I always tell people before we get on pelagic trips that we're looking for small birds in a big ocean and, and even the big birds are small. Well, the alcids are really small. <laughs> and And so it's a challenge to get a good look at these things and, and, and also have them, um, you know, cooperate with us and, and, and give us views that, that we find satisfactory. And, and in fact, I remember leading a trip for the San Diego bird fest once. And, and a guy came up to me at one point in the bow and he was pretty indignant and he goes, well, you know, when are we going to see a cast and chocolate? And I, I said, well, geez, we've seen like 40 so far and we've called every one of them out. And he goes, well, yeah, but it, none of them look like they do in my bird book. And so, um, you know, some of these species require a lot of patience and, and skilled uh, boat captains, as well as leaders who know how to manage a boat to, to get us good looks at these things. Uh, and so the other thing I recommend too is, you know, I, I have to say I love bird books. And, and as much as I tell myself and I tell my wife, I'm done buying bird books, like I just keep buying them in our house is just littered with them but um and while people like using apps or they like asking people what a bird is on the internet now right like we just take our photos well not we as in me but people put their photos on facebook tell me what this bird is right but there is nothing better than getting your nose in in bird books to you know learn how to identify species and then understand uh, things, especially before you go on a pelagic trip. I have had people when um, I call out a bird, I mean, the first thing you should do is pick up your binoculars or your camera, if that's the way you swing. Um, but I've seen people, the first thing they do is go to a bird book and they'll pick up their Nat Geo and they're looking for Cass and Zocklet. Then when they see it in the book, then they look for the bird and it's gone, right? So I'm a big fan of studying stuff before you go out and being prepared for the things you might see. 
And as far as seabirds go, these are some books that I recommend. And, and now, you know, and I didn't put slides in here because I didn't want to keep you all night, but I sometimes like showing the evolution of field guides and how, especially else, it's one of those species now that the modern general guides like the Sibley guide there, the second edition or the latest edition, seventh of the birds of North America with National Geographic, they actually represent the alcids in there really well. But if you really want to get deep and nerdy, there's, you know, the seabird guide, the old one there in the middle, all of you might have that. And then Peter Harrison just redid that recently on the right, which is very uh, worthwhile thing to get. And then that Oceanic Birds of the World uh, below there by Steve Howell and Kirk Zufelt's another great book. And I highly recommend that because I know a guy who has 22 photos of alcids in that book. Many of those you'll see tonight. Um, and so for our discussion, we're going to focus on Southern California since this is the LA Birder Group. And, and I, you know, I think what's been really great and exciting to see is how sort of jazzed and excited people have been getting about pelagic birding and you know when we run trips and I try to get trips together out of Ventura and Santa Barbara area and I also put some trips together out of Dana Point with the Dana Wharf Whale Watch down there every couple months we do a, a little six hour trip in Orange County waters um, but I think you know there's still more of a desire than the amount of time that we can get on the ocean and there's challenges to scheduling boats uh for bird watching trips right but it's it's just amazing to see now especially a lot of the la birders a lot of you guys that are on here you know going out and just getting a, a boat and renting it for the day and going out and looking at at birds um you know and kind of doing it on your own right that, that uh you know you don't have you know, me or Todd or John or someone screaming in a, a PA all day, right, that that you're out there kind of pioneering and, and looking for these birds on your own. So, um, but that'll be kind of the focus of this, looking at the species that can reasonably be seen off Southern California, you know, a few little weird vagrants at the end to prepare for, but I'm not going to really talk about them in depth. And, and you know, there's two ways to really look for alcids, and I'll, you know, I'll try to be good about breaking this up as I go through the different species, is, you know, you can look for birds from shore and, and you know there's a lot of coastal promontories like um down like point doom or point magoo um near uh you know off ventura uh, a couple places off santa barbara and the santa barbara channel uh boy like la jolla down there in san diego where they get a lot of great birds close to shore right and there's other other spots right in the pv peninsula and other places where you can look from land but you only see maybe a certain few species and then you know, once you get further offshore and you get out into some of these interesting waters and this very cool topography that we have off Southern California, uh, you know, provides uh, opportunity to, to find some of these other species. So I'm going to start going through individuals here. Um, and, and I'll also say I'm not going to try to make this too dense because, again, don't want to like go on for hours and, and don't want to make I mean, you could get real complicated about ID of things, but I always like to think like, you know, the basic understanding and learning how to identify something to a species. And then, you know, then you get more sophisticated with, you know, aging or, or sex and things as, as appropriate. But but I'm not going to get super dense on, on that. Um, so we're going to start out with our first alcid here, the common myrrh. Um, so this is a species that has a circumpolar breeding range. Um, and I'm just, these maps I'm showing here, I'm just going to show for, for North America. And these are the maps that uh, come with the Merlin app. The, uh, these are like the birds of North America maps. Uh, so it's got a circumpolar distribution, uh, breeds in real dense colonies on ledges and steep cliffs. And, and in our part of the world, in the Pacific here, it breeds from Korea over through Western Alaska to Southwest Canada, and then down in Washington uh, to California. And, and formerly, that was down to maybe Monterey County on the central coast. But now, after a 99-year absence, this species has started breeding again on the Channel Islands on San Miguel Island. Um, and, and also try to include some population estimates of some of these birds just to understand the relative abundance of some of these things. But the global population estimate for common MERS is about 18 million birds. Um, 
And so, yeah, just reestablished recently here. Um, and they breed regularly north of our areas. It, it, we typically see common MERS down here in the winter, uh, close to the Channel Islands and occasionally from shore. Um, and some years they may linger later, um, but yeah, generally are here during the winter period. Um, and this is again, one of the deeper diving species where they actually will dive to 80 meters or more to catch fish. So for identification of these, and with all of these, I'm gonna start and kind of do the classic, like we'll talk about breeding plumage and then go to uh, like non-breeding plumage. And a lot of the birds we see down here tend to be in non-breeding plumage, um, but I'm just gonna go with it this way. So in breeding plumage, common murs are a brown and white large alcid, right? This is a, a large bird, with a real pointed head and bill. Uh, their upper parts are brown to blackish brown. And I think, and if you look at the books, it tends to show them being very black, but they are a very brown bird during the breeding season. Um, under parts are white with variable streaks on their flanks. And we, you know, again, now since we have them nesting here, we will see them in this plumage. Most often during the winter time, we see them in this non-breeding plumage. And so during this non-breeding season, they have a white throat and face, a dark collar onto the breast, and then that dark stripe behind the eye. And then first winter birds, which, you know, again, from a non-breeding bird to first winter might be difficult to distinguish. If you saw a bird with a darker face and a smaller bill, that, that might be a first winter young bird. And here's just another view of, of how these common murs look when we see them here in the winter. And again, one of the, in general, one of the larger alcids that we see. Um, and again, they breed in these dense colonies. This is a picture from the Farallons, um, showing them just nesting on these ledges and along these slopes, just thousands upon thousands of birds. Um, it may be one in every hundred or one in every couple hundred birds tends to be darker than the others. And this is a photo taken off the Farallons in the summer, but you can see this bird is really dark on the neck and kind of mottly on the breast and darker along the flanks that, yeah, there'll be one in every so many birds, one in every couple hundred. That's, you know, basically a much darker in, individual and doesn't have as much white underneath. Uh, you will see some birds, and this was a bird we had off San Miguel Island a few years ago in early September. And you might look at this and see, well, that bill's kind of smaller and, you know, the bird looks kind of smaller. Maybe it's something different. Maybe it's, you know, some other exciting thing. But now that we have breeding occurring locally, you will get these um, sort of smaller two-thirds to three-quarters, you know, grown common MERS that have gone to sea. Generally, they're in these father chick pairs later in the summer. Um, but yeah, sometimes like the other bird, they're on their own and, and there's always that temptation to kind of try to twist it into something that it isn't. Um, but yeah, we will see these like sort of smaller mini MERS, but not small enough to be a merlet. Um, in flight, you know, pretty, uh, pretty unmistakable in flight you know, dark on the back, dark on the top of the wings and the head and really white underneath, brighter white certainly than any of our other large alcids, maybe save for like a horned puffin, but that's gonna look really different. Um, and then like we typically see them in the winter time, here's just another view of that. A um, little white on the underwings, really white belly. Um, yeah, and then pretty, pretty distinct. Um, the other, large alcid that we have is the pigeon guillemot. Um, in this species, again, it's one of these Pacific endemics. It breeds from Santa Barbara Island north to Siberia and then around south to Japan. Locally here, it breeds on San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, Anacapa, and Santa Barbara Island. And anywhere south of Santa Barbara Island that's a pretty good bird. Um, you know, they occur here and we just had a trip out to the Channel Islands a few weeks ago. And we just had the first one showing up for the year. They occur 
from like late winter to late summer. Uh, and they actually moved north in their non-breeding season, which was long suspected and then recently confirmed through some tracking studies. Um, but dispersing adults and juveniles can be seen close to the coast in the summer and fall. And, and I don't know, like about you guys in LA County, maybe you find some of those birds uh, along the coast in the fall. But yeah, generally, you know, if, if you get them anywhere south of Santa Barbara Island, it gets it starts to become a pretty good bird, really exceptional if you were to get one in Mexico. Um, and this is a species usually close to shore um, of the breeding islands, and they're very approachable. They're kind of an easy one to approach, but they're generally in waters less than 20 meters in depth, and they're rarely seen at sea away from their breeding areas. Um, we see some actually around the oil platforms of all places in the channel on our way, generally from Ventura to the islands. But uh, yeah, I mostly see these ones hugging the islands. And that's why we make a special effort during the right time of year to, to look for these around Anacapa and some of the islands. Um, and then their global population estimate is about 470,000 birds. So again, this just shows, and it's really, I would say, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, but this is typically the only alcid we see on land down here. Uh, it's very unusual with a lot of our smaller alcids, some of the other breeders like the merlets and auklets, they're burrow crevice nesters and they come into the islands at night to avoid predation. So yeah, this is one of the ones where if we cruise along the coast to some of the islands that we'll see them perched up on the rocks. Um, and and here's one where I was doing some field work, um, actually looking for ashy storm petrel nests in a cave years ago. Here was a, a chick in one of the caves. And, and I'll tell you, if you see a pigeon guillemot this young, you are breaking the law because you're not supposed to go into any of these sea caves where these birds are nesting. So yeah, that was kind of a fun day. Only time I've actually seen a pigeon guillemot of that age. And also here, some birds getting ready to fledge that were um, in a, a nest on Santa Cruz Island. So the identification of this, again, at this season in their alternate plumage, I mean, pigeon guillemots are fairly unmistakable in the Pacific. Um, you know, they're striking black and white medium-sized auk. Um, they have that white upper wing oval with the dark transverse, transverse bar across the bases of the greater coverts. Now, black guillemots in the Atlantic and there are some black guillemots up in the very North Pacific around Gamble, uh, they will have like a completely white wing oval without that bar, but the black bar there separates pigeon guillemot from them. Um, in flight, they have a dark underwing. And on that first slide where that one was mouthing off, you see they have a really beautiful uh, vermilion color legs and feet, which when they're flying away, especially on, on the water, you can see that and it's very striking. Now the identification of things gets a little trickier for younger birds. So and this was a bird that was seen kind of later in the season around Santa Barbara Island, actually right below the booby colony out there. But this is a, a juvenile. And while a lot of these things, I won't even focus on trying to separate juvenile from winter plumage in a lot of these birds because they're very subtle differences. But in pigeon guillemot, it's it's maybe a little more than just subtle. So these juveniles have these blackish gray upper parts with sort of distinct whitish tips on the wings or on the feathers. Um, and the underparts are like a dusky white with gray tips, especially on the breast. And, and the legs aren't really bright yet. They're kind of orange legs. But this is a, a bird, especially when they do turn up along the coast in the late summer, they do get confused with a lot of stuff. Uh, and there's one actually problematic bird I'm going to show in a few photos from now that um, asking people to correct it knee bird years ago like resulted in some really angry <laughs> and uncharacteristically angry interactions with people who just were convinced it was a common mer. I've also seen these get called marbled merlets when they're along the coast in, in the late summer. Um, they're much larger than that. Um, but yeah, the, you know, they're kind of, um, these are, are tricky compared to some of the others. Um, and a plumage that we very rarely see down here, and I actually took this photo off Washington State in the winter. Um, this is a non-breeding bird, so not necessarily a juvenile, but a non-breeding adult. And they get 
you know, considering how black they are during the breeding season, they turn almost white. They have a real whitish head with a little bit of a dusky crown and nape and that dark patch around the eye. Um, variable white barring on the upper parts and across the rump uh, and then whitish underparts. But yeah, if you're used to seeing these down here and then if you were off the coast in the Pacific Northwest and in the winter, you know, you see your first one of these, it, it might surprise you because we don't really rarely ever see them in that plumage like that down here. Um, and again, for a lot of these, I'm going to try to show flight shots too, just to be comprehensive, because oftentimes we're seeing Elsons flying away from boats. But this one in flight is pretty unmistakable. Black, large black bird, that white panel in the wing with that black line in it, and then those bright red feet. So yeah, pretty distinct. Uh, but again, where these things get tricky, like here's an adult, I believe this was in Monterey Bay in fall, that's transitioning to that winter plumage. So then it looks a little weird, and, and you could confuse this with a myrrh or, or something else. Uh, and then here is the famous Ventura Harbor bird that, in this one, when I put this photo in, this one even troubled me. And I'm going to send this around to some people because this is not what I would consider a typical plumage for a pigeon guillemot. Um, and, and when I looked at this, like, you know, yeah, it sort of bothered me the other day. And, and it surprisingly looks a bit like the snows subspecies of pigeon guillemot, which is like an endemic breeder to the Kuril Islands off of Russia, basically the Russian Aleutians. Uh, but it'd be really unlikely that that would be this, but it's kind of what it looks like. So I, you know, it's probably just a pigeon guillemot, but I'm going to send it around to some folks. Well, even if it's a snows right now, it is a pigeon guillemot until it gets split, which that is a potential split. But yeah, even you do see some weird birds like this that can be troubling in the fall. And this bird, because there was a red third pipit on the beach down there, people were looking for the pipit, saw this, and so many people put this on their checklist as a common myrrh, but this is a, this is a pigeon guillemot. Um, so now I'm going to transition sort of within that same subfamily to some of the smaller birds, the merlets. Um, and the merlets, I will say, as being a purveyor of pelagic trips out here in the Pacific are some of the more desired birds for local birders, traveling birders alike, right? And these are some of the most wanted birds in North America. And if you get that book that I said earlier, right, I think Creveri's scripts and um, Guadalupe merlets are three of the hundred most wanted birds. So, um, yeah, these... These birds, and this is a Scripps's merlet, has a really restricted breeding range. And it's only found on about 12 islands over a distance of about 500 miles um, from San Miguel Island as its northernmost breeding site to the San Benitos Islands off Mexico. Um, and they breed on all of the Channel Islands except for Santa Rosa and San Nicolas. Though we'll say that the Navy folks on San Nicolas are starting to kind of advance seabird study out there and they're starting to find ashy storm petrels on the island, which they never knew occurred out there. And it and it may be that Scripps's merlets might be one of the next things they find nesting out there. Um, and so these can occur in Southern California year round, but they tend to disperse either far out to sea after breeding or they disperse northward as this map shows. Um, so January to September is the best time to see scripses when they're near the breeding areas. And, and I do get a lot of traveling birders that come out for a September, October pelagic trip. And they said, well, I can't wait to see my first, you know, my life scripts is Merlet. And I tell them, well, you may have to wait till a spring trip because oftentimes by September, they, they tend to be gone. Um, and there's other things in here Well, they tend to occur in pairs and, um, Chicks leave the nest within a few days and um, swim out to see with the males. I'll have a photo of that coming up here. And then we've had some interesting restoration going on here too, that numbers locally had declined, um, but then they did a rat eradication on Anacapa Island, which had a lot of non-native rats out there. And, and after that restoration, um, the merlets really came back like gangbusters uh, and were found in crevices they haven't been seen in in, in decades. So they they seem to be um, between what management has been done in the Channel Islands as well as some management occurring now off the west coast of Mexico. Um, 
some of these small murrelets seem to be rebounding and, and increasing in numbers. Um, but still, they have a pretty low global population size, maybe less than 20,000 breeding birds. Um, and again, yeah, really restricted range and, and only moderately surveyed and studied. So um, yeah, it's something that we're, we're learning more about and directing more management towards to their benefit. And then here's just a little graphic uh, back when they were still the Zantusas Merlet. Um, but this just shows those breeding islands um, and those couple islands where they, they don't occur. But yeah, they're almost on every island from San Miguel down to, to San Benitos and Cedros. And then I just had to show a couple gratuitous photos here. So this is a Scripps's Merlet that I found. And you might think, well, gosh, is that a natural rock crevice? And here's this bird with these two eggs. And my, my wife had looked over my shoulder where I was putting this presentation together the other day. And she was just shocked at the size of the egg <laughs> compared to the body of the bird. That when that thing's carrying an egg, it probably doesn't have much room for anything else in there. But, but this uh, nest I found actually in stairwell of the old uh, defunct lighthouse on San Benitos Island off the coast of Baja. So that was pretty cool. One of the few Scripps's Merlet nests that I've ever seen. So getting into the identification of these. And so with the Alcids, I would have to say probably these three small Merlets I'll be talking about here now are, are maybe some of the trickier ones to distinguish, especially at if looks at sea aren't that great. But with Scripps's Merlet, you know, it's kind of a thick set, small little Merlet with kind of the thickest bill of any of those um, species. The upper parts tend to be kind of like a brown black with a grayish cast. Uh, I, I tend to think of them being more grayish black. Um, the ear coverts, always seem to be a little offsettingly lighter, like they're kind of like these slate ear coverts. And some birds can really show almost lighter, like they have a light streak behind the eye. And on here, the black goes below the eye with a little white wedge-shaped patch in front of the eye, which is variable. Some birds show that more than others. I think maybe in some juveniles, it's, it's maybe less pronounced. Um, they have white underparts with some gray modeling on the flanks, which again is more pronounced maybe in younger birds. The underwing is mainly white. Um, and the books will tell you, and, and this is true, but I'm going to tell you to be cautious about this white on the chin. And the only reason I say this is because, um, and I did want this to be a talk and not a lecture at you, but I, I had a slide that I was going to put in here and I didn't about um, a slide I use in a lot of talks called Why We Misidentify Birds. And one of the things I see on pelagic trips are when people are excited and they want to get a Scripps's Merlet as a life bird or a Curveres or a Guadalupe, they tend to see things they want to see and they might focus in on one field mark. And why I'm showing you all this stuff here too is that I, you know, I refer to this as single field mark syndrome. And I, and I thought that I had maybe coined that term and I was some really smart guy, but then before I bragged about that too much, I searched on the internet and there's some busybody guy, Kimball Garrett or something. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of him in Los Angeles, but Kimball Garrett had, had coined that term, but I really cautioned people against using a single field mark to jump to a positive identification of a bird. And I've seen that with Merlitz where people are like, I saw that just white on the chin, it's a script. It's like, oh my gosh, like, you know, you're lucky to see that maybe if you had it in the hand or really carefully examined photographs and it is variable. So that is something to be careful about. And I also put on here, and I'm not gonna do this with many of the other alsage, but the call can be important. And we oftentimes will hear them at sea and in this little high pitched seat that they do is different than the Guadalupe's and Carveri's that they can be confused with. Um, and so here we could talk about underwing. Um, so here's a bird that's kind of sitting on the water and stretching its wings. And you can see that the underwing is primarily white, which is, you know, favors that being a Scripps or a Guadalupe. Um, see birds taken off the water as we often see them when they're maybe scared or flushing away from the boat. And this one I like, and I have some photos like this where it shows the downstroke on one bird and the upstroke on the other. But you know, you can't obviously judge the underwing when you can't see it, but when you can, you know, it is, it is really white on those underwing coverts, a little duskier towards that trailing edge. 
Um, but yeah, something, in, and we're going to have some comparison shots here soon with the other species. And this is also showing too that all the Scintillobaranthus merlets leap directly into flight, which is also a good clue where things like Cassin's auklets have to run to get airborne if they can. Sometimes they need a lot to get moving if they've been eating a lot. And this is just a photo to illustrate from one of our summer trips that we do get um, adults with these chicks at sea. So this is a really young chick and they, within one to two days, leave the nest jump into the water and swim out to sea with the, um, oftentimes the male, but sometimes we see them and it appears like it might be the pair with the chick. Um, and then here's a younger bird that's kind of getting rid of some of those, um, you know, downy feathers and started to growing in its first plumage there. Um, and I want to just show this because this some people actually this bird confused some people on the trip and they all sent their pictures to Paul Lehman to ask like oh you know tell me this is a Guadalupe Merla well it isn't this is a, a scripts and I'm actually going to you know after I show you Guadalupe's we're going to have a side by side comparison to show the difference but that's kind of an extreme of that white comma up in front of the eye on scripts. So next here is Guadalupe Merlet. This has to be certainly one of the most wanted birds off Southern California or the West Coast and a very difficult bird to see on day trips. Um, and I saw Tom Benson on the list here and I know Tom's tried to organize a bunch of day trips to, to you know, have this among other birds be found. And, and this is a tough one to find without spending a couple of days out at sea. Um, and here's its range, has a real low global population size, meaning less than 5,000 breeding birds, maybe the rarest alcid in the world. It's kind of in a dead heat for that with the Japanese merlet. Um, and it's probably the one with the most restricted range. It breeds primarily on Guadalupe Island off the coast of Mexico, uh, with small numbers breeding at San Benito Island as well. And I've seen them at San Benito Island in the spring when I've been down there. Um, occasionally, they've been seen in burrows on Santa Barbara Island and some of my seabird colleagues uh, recently confirmed breeding on San Clemente Island in lovely Los Angeles County and there was I think just a paper that just got published maybe in the last issue of Western Birds uh, but I will say you know a lot of times these things can be doom and gloom about the status of some of these species but there's been some restoration and management recently on Guadalupe Island and I just saw some of my uh, Mexican colleagues presenting on this recently, and they have actually put up a predator-proof fence on the south end of Guadalupe Island. They have removed the cats and rats within that fenced area, and in 2015, when they erected that fence, they had two breeding pairs of Guadalupe merlets on that part of the island. Last year, in 2022, they had nearly 700 birds breeding in there, 700 pairs. Um, so just making an incredible rebound and in, in increase in population. And I know I mentioned that to Todd McGrath and he said, well, make sure you don't tell people that because then they're going to expect that we're going to find these birds on our trips. <laughs> um, but in the non-breeding season, they do move north and that's when we see them. And they go down as far as Cabo and then north up to Southern British Columbia. Best time of year to see them out here is generally July or August to about October. Um, so identification, um, you know, they look Similar to the Scripps's merlet, and they used to be, you know, one species called the um, Xanthus's merlet years ago. But they do have a white face with a real spiky, thin bill. And this is something that I was noticing looking through photographs and then in Peter Harrison's recent book, which, by the way, says great text describing um, identification marks for seabirds, which a lot of books sometimes skim the text for pictures, but he does a really good job in there. But yeah, they, he mentions that spiky thin bill, which is something I notice in the field and noticed in photographs, has the white above and over the eye, so way more than that little comma on the scripts, certainly more pelagic than its congener. So yeah, we tend to see them farther offshore. They're difficult to get on a day trip, like I said, um, even though I might try setting up some trips out of Santa Barbara to do that, um, but it's pretty precarious setting up a trip to find a bird. And if we had a bad weather day, it could be a lot of disappointed people and that's not fun. Um, again, kind of those dark upper parts with a gray cast, white underparts, uh, a little bit of black just below the eye and those gray ear coverts like Scripps has. And like the Scripps, mainly white underwing, but where they really differ is they have a rattling trill that's very similar to Kaveri's merlet. 
And even though I have to say, I haven't heard many Guadalupe's at sea, I've heard a couple, but Carveri's is one we often have heard given a, a trill and that gives away its, its uh, identification. Um, and we often find these merlets, actually all the merlets, uh, but scripts and, and Guadalupe especially tend to be in pairs. Um, even though I will say, we do see, and we had this one on a day trip out of Ventura a few years ago, a, this actually may be the lone Guadalupe Merlet of Santa Barbara Island, but we did have an individual. And sometimes if I see a lone Merlet out to sea, it tends to be a Guadalupe. Um, and they have that whitish underwing here, like script shows. Um, and again here too, and I'm kind of showing these two to kind of show different lighting conditions because, you know, we are lucky to sometimes have nice bright days. A lot of times it's kind of gray and dingy out there, but this still shows to be a fairly white underwing. Um, and then here's a bird that, again, you could look at this and go, oh, is that enough white or over and around the eye to be a Guadalupe? Because, you know, no, you know, they're not all exactly the same looking, but comparing that with that scripts from earlier, right, we see that thinner bill. And then that white does really wrap up on this bird where this scripts is merlet to the right, just has that little bit of a comma there, but again, variable. Um, the next one of these merlets, uh, and a bird that I'd say used to be a lot rarer and we're tending to see a lot more of them now. And, and that could be a variety of different reasons. I'd like to think it's because we're getting better at finding them, but it may be just that there's more of them around or ocean conditions are favoring them, but that's the Creveris Merlet. Um, they breed off central Mexico in the Gulf of California and now on a few islands on the Pacific side. Um, they're uncommon to rare in the late summer here and fall, generally from like late July to early October. They can be difficult to distinguish from scripts. Uh, we rely primarily on the underwing and the call, which again is this trill or this like uh, like a kind of a little six note whistle that they do. Um, and there's a couple other things I mentioned here too, but they have a low global population size, less than 20,000 breeding birds, and they're significantly reduced from historic levels. But now I think in Mexico, they're starting to manage some of those islands a little better. And, and we're hoping that they're going to rebound and increase in numbers like Guadalupe seem to be doing as well as Scripps. And maybe it is why we're seeing more off off Southern California when they, again, like the other, uh, like Guadalupe's dispersed north in that post-breeding season. So for identification, again, you know, a dark merlet with a relatively long bill and tail. Um, and, you know, scripts will sometimes sit with their tails cocked, but with these Carveris, when they're on the water, it looks almost like a Sora's tail sticking up that tails longer and very pronounced and they do tend to hold it up more than the others. Um, they again have these like sort of brownish black upper parts that'll tend to brown with wear. But I will say I've had people try to string Carveris and they say, well, that Merlet's brown. And I read that in a book and that's a Carveris. And again, like me, eh, I wouldn't say Carveris look brown so much as they look darker than the other Merlets do on the back. And they also have this like sort of black below the eye and a much straighter border than the other two species, obviously, to me, which also lines up with the bill and gives them sort of a longer headed appearance. So the combination of that long bill and that line on the face, to me, always gives them sort of a longer faced look. Um, they have the white underparts with the dark breast spur, which is more obvious in flight. And we'll look at that in a few pictures here. But they have dusky underwing coverts so they're darker on the underwing and again they're supposed to be black on the chin but like i said for scripts and then for guadalupe like gotta be cautious with that chin coloration as you know not in combination with other things and again like likely you know usually occur in pairs but sometimes we've been seeing now carveries and in, in sort of larger groups um in the late summer um so you know, oftentimes we can find large numbers of, of birds sitting on the water together, you know, sometimes dozens of birds. Um, but yeah, like here, can you see that line down the side of the face running into the bill, that pointy tail sticking up. So just have a few photos here just to kind of reinforce some of these things. And, and this was one, depending how I treated this photo, these birds could look very brown or very black, depending how much um, mess with some of the histograms and stuff. And I tried to be more neutral in how I did that. 
Uh, again, another one here showing that. And this really does show the black on the chin along the face. Um, but here's the key thing we look for when these birds flush. And look how dusky this underwing is, even though there's like a little bit of white there. Um, those underwing coverts tend to be very dusky. And then you can see that spur just behind um, the head that comes down. The other merlets don't show that. Um, again, here, just to reinforce it, dusky underwings and that spur. And that spur can be really helpful because we have birds occasionally we see like this, that with a low, and this was like taken in low afternoon light on a sunny day south of Anacapa Island. And that underwing looks pretty bright. And we've had people on fall trips that want to see a Scripps as Merlot that say, well, there's a white underwing and that's a Scripps. But, but it's not. This is a Curveris. And it's just that the light is creating a brighter flash than maybe is really there. Uh, but that spur there tells you, right, that's a Curveris Merlot. These are Curveris Merlots, um, no doubt about that. But yeah, you got to watch and be cautious of, of lighting conditions out there. And this is just a side-by-side -side here to show with a scripts on the left and Curveris on the right, some of these things we've talked about. And, uh, you know, we used to be like, we really waited for the underwings on these things, but I think that the extent of black there and how it is aligned on the face, to me, I think now Curveris jump out at me a little more than, than they used to. Uh, and this here shows a comparison of, of the underwings and, and that white on the, uh, scripts there on the left versus that dusky on the careeries. Um, we do see some other merlets down here, but they're rare. And I won't go through these maybe terribly exhaustively, and I will be careful about time. Um, but ancient merlets uh, breed way far to the north of us, um, and they will breed over in Japan and, and Russia, and then they're in North America, they breed from the Aleutian Islands and the Northern Gulf of Alaska, south to um, Haida Gwaii and British Columbia. In fact, there's apparently pretty huge numbers of them out there. Um, I think they number about maybe 1.2 million birds in their range, but a lot of them, I guess most of them breed in British Columbia. And historically, they used to breed further south, but um, seem to have declined or disappeared from those areas. Um, they do move south in the winter, and I think this range map isn't very fair. Um, I think that non-breeding range should extend at least down to Point Conception, if not around the Horn a little bit. Um, some winters down here, we can see them, and you could see them from the coast, and they can have a sort of eruption years and be common. Other years, they're absent. Generally, when they're here, though, they're present maybe from about November to April, and you can see them from shore. Um, Identification-wise, Chunky, short build, uh, Alcid, Merlet, black head with the variable white phyla plumes in the breeding season. And I should have put breeding on the bullets here. Uh, the yellowish bill, white that right wraps up around the sides of the neck and it's on the underparts as well. Sort of a narrow black tab from the nape uh, with white spots. And these slate gray upper parts are really distinct. Uh, and they also have these gray coverts. Um, in darker primaries and secondaries on the upper wing. Um, and I'll show a photo here in a second of the underwing, which is really white with a gray trailing edge on it. Uh, but we don't often see birds down here in breeding season. Sometimes late now in the spring, if you're lucky enough to catch a couple offshore, you might. But generally we get birds in this non-breeding plumage here, which has really, uh, those white plumes are reduced or mostly absent. I mean, this one, you can maybe see a few little white spots above the eye. Uh, blackish hood and lures, and then like a dusky chin and throat. But that bill is still have that bright bill, which is pretty distinct. Um, and then this is likely a juvenile, um, which has a whiter chin and throat than the non-breeding adults do. Um, but here in, in flight, they're, they're pretty distinct, especially if they're in breeding plumage. But yeah, that white underwing. Um, and then... Even if we flush a bird away before we've had a good chance to look at it on the ocean, that gray back is very diagnostic. And you will see that gray back on these birds as they flush away. Um, so from that, we'll go to another one of the merlets that is rare down here, which is marbled merlet. Um, 
and they breed from southern Alaska south to about central California to the Santa Cruz Mountains is their southern extent of their breeding range. Um, and they also breed in a couple other spots along the California coast. And this is the one we looked at that nest tree earlier, right? They breed in the canopy of moist old growth forests, but feed in near shore waters. And they tend to not occur more than a couple kilometers offshore. Um, and this is a federally threatened species, at least in Washington, California and Oregon. And the population throughout the range is about 480,000 birds. Um, and while they breed up there, some individuals will regularly move south, and they're pretty regular down to about the San Luis Obispo coast in northern Santa Barbara County. South of Point Conception, they're rare, and I have to say, Harry Carter and I were working on a paper on this, and Harry unfortunately passed away a couple years ago, and so uh, when I find some free time, which I generally don't have, I, we have started to work on a paper on the status of marbled murrelets south of Point Conception, and hopefully I will finish that at some point soon. But uh, you know, we occasionally do get birds down here in the winter. Um, and yeah, you know, once they leave those breeding areas and the oceans, they spend most of their time in those near shore waters at sea. And for identification in their breeding plumage, which we rarely see down here, I have seen them in breeding plumage off um, Vandenberg Air Force Base in the summer. Uh, but a small, real chunky, dark brown merlet with kind of some gold and rusty highlights. They have that kind of paler color on the throat and then around uh, to the nape, which then gets more pronounced in their non-breeding plumage. Um, really kind of like little olive tipped scapulars and underparts. So they're kind of really sort of a, a real patterned, cryptic looking bird. Um, at least in the breeding season. And this was again, a photo Todd McGrath provided for me. Um, in the non-breeding season, they're much more striking. Again, we had that sort of ptarmigan effect going on with them, but then they become sort of black above and white below with that white wrapping around the neck and the sides. And it makes it real, that makes it easy to separate them from other murrelets we see, as well as that white on the scapulars that form that horizontal band on the wing and then you see that in flight too but but marbled merlets are are pretty distinct um if given a good look at them um and the juveniles are like a non-breeding adult tend to be just maybe a little browner on the upper parts and the under parts um and here's just a, a shot this is one of my favorite photos i've taken i actually jumped to the bottom of a boat, sat my butt in the <laughs> bottom to get this bird at, at eye level from a small boat up in Santa Cruz. Uh, and this is like a, actually likely a juvenile bird with that white in front of the eye and a little more modeling on the breast. And they, like a lot of the other ones, can occur in, in pairs too. But not going to linger too long on these. They are, are rare down here. Um, Kind of going to get through the rest of the auklets here in, in the puffins. Um, so a bird that is common down here, at least at certain times of year, is Casson's auklet. And these breed on offshore islands from the Aleutians down to Baja, sizable colonies on the Farallons and Channel Islands. And in the Channel Islands, they breed on San Miguel, Santa Cruz, Anacapa, Santa Barbara, and the Coronados. Um, but compared to some of these merlets that have pretty restricted uh, population numbers, the estimate for these is about 2.5 to 5 million birds in their global population. Um, and we do see them here in the summer. They can be kind of uncommon here when they're breeding, um, but then they are fairly common in the winter or, or you know, from maybe like November to, to June, winter into spring. Uh, and their numbers can fluctuate and vary with numbers of birds arriving from the north. Um, and so for the identification of these, and again, they're they're pretty distinct, but we often don't get very good looks at them. This is one of the birds I think that dislikes boats more than some of the others. And like that guy asked me on that trip, like, you know, when do I get that field guide look? And well, sometimes you just don't, but um, but it's the small auklet without plumes. If you see a small auklet with a plume on its head, it's something good down here. Um, but this is the one small auklet without plumes. They're just sort of a plump gray bird. Um, adults have a real pale eye that short triangular bill that's kind of pale at the base. Um, and then that little white um, sort of flash above the eye. Uh, slate gray upper parts. Yeah, it's really gray overall, but but they are whitish underneath. 
Um, and that's something I've seen people when these flush, if they see white on the underside of the bird, they think it's a merlap, but the, the hawklets definitely have some white on the belly. And this is just a couple other shots of showing what they look like on, on the water. Um, this I would say is an adult, birds like this with a darker eye or, or likely younger birds. Um, and that one's kind of got an in-between uh, there. And this may be a bird that's just, this was a, one I took a couple of weeks ago, maybe it's coming into, gonna be an adult soon. And again, here taken off a um, little bit of white, pale on the underwing, um, not as much as like a Scripps as the Guadalupe Merlet, but maybe not as dusky as a, as a Creveris. Um, and yeah, they do have that white underneath on the belly, but just a real gray, fat little football shaped bird. Um, and another one here showing that um, the white and the white on the underwing. And I'm going to have this in a comparison here in a minute. Um, Another bird that is rare, but gosh, Paul Lehman found one off uh, San Diego the other day is parakeet auklet. Um, and we've had some luck running into these things too. Um, and again, this is a breeding bird. They breed from the Bering Sea um, to the Gulf of Alaska here in the U.S. And they're also in the Russian Far East, a global population estimate about 1.2 million birds. Here they're very rare in the winter and, and, and occasional spring visitors, Southern California it doesn't quite show it on the range map there. The species that I think if we got offshore more in the winter and we went out to about the 500 fathom line, we might find these more often. Um, they tend to be a little less gregarious than some of their other little auklet friends and usually are in sort of see them alone or in small groups as opposed to some of these other auklets that occur up north that can be occur in large numbers. And like I mentioned earlier, that kind of crazy looking bill they have is adapted to feeding on jellyfish. So during the breeding season, these are, you know, they're a stocky auklet. Uh, they're chunky looking, large round head. They have that sort of weird upturned bill. And that head in the back, um, they're kind of like a really sooty black with that white plume on the face. Um, and these breeding birds have that bright orange bill, um, and a little mottled on the upper breast and the flanks, but are generally whitish underneath. Um, and then when you see them with those underwings compared to cassins or darker, um, and this is just a better example of that. Um, and I've seen birds off Southern California, I had a bird that got away on a summer trip a few years ago in really rough seas. That was clearly a, a parakeet auk. It was this was really dark city auk with dark under wings. Um, and then you know the the funny story. And I know we're at about an hour here, but um, I have to tell this because you know I I sometimes used to feel that I was the Rodney Dangerfield of of pelagic birding in Southern California. Where sometimes like. You know, hey, uh, you know, if any of you are old enough to remember Rodney Dangerfield and his act, you know, I get no respect, but I uh, was on a trip once and uh, I saw a bird on the water that was an auklet with a plume behind its eye. And I notified my other leaders. I said, hey, there's, I just had an auklet with a plume behind its eye. And they were like, Dave, it's just a cast. And I'm like, well, but no, I had a, had a plume, I swear. Dave, it's just a cast. And so, that was the end of that. And, and then the next week or two later, we're out in the same waters uh, on the condor, and we're on a big line of birds on the water, and I see a bird sitting on the water with a plume behind its eye. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, and then one of the participants ran in. He's like, did you see that bird? And I said, yeah, I'm going to turn the boat. And the other leaders were in the, in the bow, and I, I turned the boat around with the captain, and and one of them got very indignant and screaming at me, like, why are you turning the boat when we're on all these birds and I said well look look in front of you on the water and there were four parakeet auklets sitting on on the water and so I will say like if you know you're on a boat whether you're leading or you're a participant if someone thinks they have an auklet with a plume behind the eye that is something that's worth slowing the boat down for or looking at because um, it's going to be something it's going to be something special and most likely down here it would be a parakeet auklet. And this just is a little flight comparison here to show. And I did want to do a couple, you know, a bunch of these side by side things because again, you can only, I think you can only misidentify a bird if something looks similar to it, right? And so this just shows the difference between a Cassin's auklet and, and the parakeet with those underwings in particular and in that 
what the faces look like. And, and these parakeets here are non-breeding birds. And these were, by the way, photographed off Morro Bay, off San Luis Obispo in January one year. Um, so skipping ahead, last couple birds here. Um, the larger ones, the puffins and allies. Um, and this bird is a bird that actually has been around a lot this year. And this was a photo I took a couple of weeks ago, actually, of a rhinoceros auklet. Um, and again, a Pacific endemic breed from Korea all the way around down the Pacific Northwest, the Aleutians. Um, and, and get to California, um, they did document breeding in the early 90s on San Miguel Island, and that was a reestablishment after a long time, but I don't know if they've been seen there recently. This bird I photographed off Anacapa a few weeks ago, and I'm convinced after the rat eradication that there's a couple pairs of rhinos breeding on the south side of Anacapo, but no one's found a nest yet. But uh, the population estimate for these guys is about 1.3 million birds in the world. Um, but down here, we tend to see them more late fall through the early spring. And occasionally they can be really abundant in the winter. They tend to be more common to the north, but there are some winters. This one has been an exceptional one. Every time I've been offshore, there's been lots of rhinoceros chocolates this winter. Other years they can be be absent. Um, these are a, a burrow nester, unlike the surface nesters we looked at earlier, like, like the MERS. Um, and, but even though they're a burrow nester, they can breed in pretty dense colonies. Um, and they do occur in groups offshore. Sometimes, you know, we'll see six, eight, 10, 12, 20 birds sitting together. Um, and they tend to be a little more approachable than some of the other auklets. And we get good looks at them in boats. Um, and so this is one we don't often see a bird that looks like sort of in this high of a breeding plumage down here, but we will get some um, in the in the springtime. This was a bird just taken off off Washington. Um, so again, breeding birds are a puffin ally with uh, this unique bill horn and this angular head, very squat and chunky when they're in the water, and they sit low with their head tucked down generally, mostly kind of this dull sooty brown with the orange bill. Uh, in that crazy little horn that they'll get in the breeding season, but then they shed that later. Um, and as far as the facial plumes go, like we said, the parakeet auklet has a single plume, the rhinoceros auklet has the two white facial plumes, one from behind the eye and one from the gape. Um, and they do have a whiter belly when you see them take off. Um, so non-breeding season, the bill is duller and um, they have, they sort of lose that horn and the white facial stripes tend to be either reduced or absent. With it being this absent, this could be a juvenile bird even though the bill's fairly orange. Um, juveniles tend to have a duller bill and a darker iris. Uh, and this you know, can get kind of tricky to, to tell those apart. And here's another one too. This one is probably a, a juvenile that was in a local harbor here, uh, but they can be a real variable when you see them in the winter. And here's two birds in December of Ventura together and one bird, you know, is almost getting into breeding plumage and the other is much more delayed than that. So two birds sitting together can look pretty different. They may be even the same age. Uh, and a flight shot here too, big kind of a big dusky alcid, sort of large headed, but not quite as large headed as a puffin. And you will see that white on the underside. And we often see this view of these things cruising around um, on our trips out there. So last couple, birds here, um, tufted puffin. And puffins are bird, if we ever see one of those on a trip, you know, we're very fortunate. I think I've only seen maybe two tufted puffins off Southern California. Um, their breeding range is from sort of the Russian Far East and Japan all the way around through Alaska and down to about the Farallons, maybe down to Monterey County. Um, and they did sort of reoccupy San Miguel Island in the early 90s, but I don't know that they've been confirmed there since then. So they tend to be rare off Southern California, most likely to occur um, in January through September, but there's not really a clear pattern. Some of these puffins tend to show up later in the winter in the spring. Um, and there's been a few puffins off San Diego and LA in the last month or so. Um, and they're usually found singly when they're down here. In general, most places in California, I've 
really only seen seems like individual birds, even in Monterey Bay. Um, but oftentimes they're approachable, sometimes attracted to the feeding activity of other birds, which is unusual among alcids, but you'll see that with the puffins. Um, and these birds probably move further out to sea and north along the coast in the winter. Um, identification wise, large, really dark puffin, really black. Uh, none of the other puffins are, are completely black on the underside with that massive bill. Um, and they have that white face and forehead with the golden plumes and, and look sort of clown-like. Um, and they have that orange bill with the yellowish to green gray base and that orange gape rosette there. Um, yeah, and then I, you know, never thought of these things being so clown-like before, but then I have to say, you know, I was at a conference in Washington, the Seabird Conference, and was walking back from being out and having some cocktails with some friends, and, and I was walking down this dark street up in, in Tacoma, and I saw this balloon floating out of a sewer, and I looked down, and there was a tufted puffin staring at me, and he said if I came down there with him, I would float, because all the others float, but uh, I tried to go down there and I couldn't fit in the sewer. So I guess that was probably a good thing. Um, so non-breeding birds, and I guess you'd have to see, be a Stephen King fan to understand that reference. So non-breeding birds, and these are generally the way we see them down here. They shed that outer bill sheath. And the dark face, it could be really variable, appears sort of black at a distance. This was this bird off San Diego a couple of weeks ago. And it's starting to get that white on the face, but the plumes get reduced or absent. And that gape also shrinks as well. And here's another view of another bird with a much darker face. But, you know, you got to be careful and look for these amongst flocks of like rhinoceros auklets. Um, and that orange bill can be striking, right? But a very dark bird with a fat head and that sort of broader orange bill uh, can clue you in that it's a puffin. But that one in San Diego, we went past it before we figured that one out uh, a month ago. And in here, just a shot in flight to show just how dark they are and big fat headed and fat billed. So when, especially the breeding birds, pretty unmistakable. I don't think you can mess that up with anything else, even the other puffins, because they're white underneath. Uh, the ones that do get tricky are these sort of recently fledged juveniles. And we don't see many like this down here. And this was a bird I think I saw off on the Cordell Bank in the late summer. But look at this bird with this kind of smaller bill and real dark face. And, and you, know, you may initially think, well, maybe that's a rhinoceros auklet. And then here's a, a different photo of that same individual compared to a rhinoceros auklet there on the left. And the auklets have a thinner bill. And, and with the puff, and even at that young age, you start to see some of that lighter color behind the eye on it. But you have to you know, look at these birds carefully. And if you have a bird that's far away from the boat and it's got its head turned like those ones we looked at earlier, right? It might be really difficult to, to distinguish one of these. So again, one of these ones, and I always say like, you got to look at every rhino auklet in the winter, especially if you see large numbers, because that's when some puffin might be sitting with them. Um, and the last one here of the regularly occurring, if you want to call them that, um, is horn puffin. And again, this is a breeding bird, might not see one like this down here. And they breed again from, you know, the Russian Far East all the way over to um, Alaska and maybe south to about coastal British Columbia. And there's about maybe 1.2 million of these suckers out there in the world. Um, their occurrence down here is really irregular. They're kind of a very rare vagrant in winter to late spring, kind of January to June. There's been years where there's been invasions and they can bring huge, like bring anywhere from tens to hundreds to the California coast. Uh, and I'm trying to remember what that last year was where we had an invasion. I want to say maybe it was like 2006 or 2007. I should have looked that up and I didn't before the talk, but I know people were running up and down the coast trying to get horn puffin in every county. Um, I want to say that was maybe, yeah, maybe that was 2006, 2007. Um, they often travel in small groups and tend to feed alone. Um, so breeding plumage bird, again, we really wouldn't see that so much down here, except that invasion year, there were some that looked close to this, um, sort of a paler build version of an Atlantic puffin. They have that black forehead crown and nape and the necklace. Um, 
you know, that red orbital ring around the eye with that fleshy upright horn. That's, you know, why we call them horn puffins in that dark cheek line, mainly yellow bill with the red tip and that kind of nice orange to yellow gape rosette. And just really clearly sort of black up top and white below. Remember the tufted puffins, right? Never were going to be white on that underside. Um, just another, you know, different view, slightly different light kind of casts a warmer light, makes the bill almost look more uniform colored. Uh, but I think taken same place, same day, just different hour of the day. Uh, but here's like kind of when we see them down here and I'm probably a couple of you on here that are smiling, remembering this bird that we saw off LA last spring. But when we do see them down here, they're in this non-breeding plumage, which has a smaller gray bill, still has like a little bit of a red tip. It's still kind of a fat bill or you look at it and you think it's a puffin but not as big as it is during the breeding season because they shed that. Uh, but the face is darker, especially in front of the eye, but they're still kind of gray faced. And, um, you know, that that they lose sort of that horn above the eye and then that gape rosette shrinks, but still a, a puffin. And, and this one, you know, when I found this bird out in front of the boat, I didn't want to sort of yell it too quick because I wanted to be sure. But I remember saying, I said to everyone, yeah, you start looking at this bird because I think it's good. and and at least one of our favorite uh, local birders got upset with me. He's like, well, what do you think it is? And I said, well, I think it's a puffin. And he really indignantly said, well, but it's got a white underside. And I said, well, yeah, because I think it's a horned puffin. <laughs> and, and he just didn't believe me until Ryan Terrell came up screaming it. But, um, and then here's another one that John and I found off San Miguel Island one year in the spring. So just here, a couple, these are the only two I've ever seen off Southern California, but real similar looking with that dark gray on the face. Um, but again, you got to check through all these flocks of um, of rhinoceros oculates in particular. Um, and just showing these things in flight, white on the belly, white on the face, that, you know, dark necklace. And I think even a non-breeding bird would look similar just with that grayer face and smaller bill. Um, so now, almost done. Just going to show a couple birds that have been recorded in California. Not going to go into any depth on identification of these, but just to sort of mention them and, and to be aware that these are possibilities. And this one is thick-billed myrrh. Uh, and this is a breeding bird off Russia. I didn't have a, a non-breeding photo, and I, I didn't really poke enough people to try to get one. And I, I don't like stealing people's photos off the internet. But uh, but this is really a vagrant in California. I think 51 state records only one South of Point Conception off Palos Verdes in LA County, 21 May, 1994. Uh, but most records of this species in California are in Monterey Bay and then further north. Um, those records tend to fall mid-August to early April with most of them being like September to December. So that bird in May was really unusual, maybe doing something like those puffins do. Uh, and here they are in flight little stouter looking and again the shorter thicker bill than the common MERS have but boy re really unlikely to see one down here but something you know always good to be aware of these things another species and this one never recorded in southern california but it could happen is the long-billed merlet um i've only actually seen this bird in russia and got very brief looks at that i thought that when i was off the coast of russia i would see tons of these and the Russian biologists were like, no, they're pretty much disappearing everywhere. And they they said there's like one day where we might see them, and that's the day we did. But a species that is probably going through a huge decline that's largely being undetected because they're in Russia. Um, it's a vagrant California, 31 records for the state. No SoCal records, but it could occur. Uh, there's coastal records from Santa Cruz to Del Norte. And then also some records at Mono Lake in the early 80s. And that's one of the things... Before this was split, and this used to be part of marbled merlet and then got split, all the inland merlet records of marbled merlets, then when they went and re-examined them, are all this species, including ones that have turned up on the East Coast. And if there's a merlet at an inland site, I will tell you it's going to be either, highly likely it's going to be a long-billed merlet or an ancient merlet. Another one where there's one record in California, so we just have to at least mention it, is Kitlitz's merlet. Um, there's one record, a bird found on a beach in La Jolla, 16 August, 1969. I didn't chase that bird because I was 11 months old, but, um, it's, you know, the natural occurrence of that bird had been questioned and especially being a, it was a juvenile and being that far South at that date, but it showed no signs of being 
captive or weird. So it was accepted by the CBRC. I mean, I would, you know, say that a lot of these birds that turn up could even be ship assists and maybe it wasn't so much in captivity, but it might have rode a ship, might have been attracted to lights like alcids are. So that's a possibility too. And I'm not, you know, going to try to invalidate a record or anything, but it did occur, but it's it's unlikely, but something we should keep an eye out for. And same thing with crested auklet. There's two records in California, Sonoma and Marin County in June, July. Um, so it's quite, it's quite possible, right? That one could occur. And I know the people that found one of the ones off Marin, and I hear about that all the time from them every time I see them. Did I tell you about the time I saw the crested auklet? Yes, you have. Um, so it would be an exciting bird to get here, but would be highly unusual. Uh, and the same thing can be said for least auklet. One record in California of a weakened bird that eventually died 15 June 1981. Again, a summer bird. And I will say, and this is one of those intriguing, you know, X Files kind of things, but um, I have some friends that were doing a snowy plover survey on San Nicolas Island. Um, and one of them brought a photo to me and he's like, look, we had this bird sitting offshore. This was like on their summer survey, I think. And, and he's like, what do you think this is? And it was this crappy photo of this real distant small bird sitting on the water. And I was like, God, if you had a gun to my head, I'd call that a least auklet. And he's like, well, that's what we thought it was too. But the photo's just not good enough. Or I'd have to actually poke him and see if he still has that picture he lives like a mile away from me I can go bug him but uh but yeah we may have had one off San Nicolas Island so again a real tiny also but something maybe we should be just keep in the back of our head again anytime you see an auklet like this one or this one see that plume behind the eye that should that single plume should you know just raise a flag that you have a really rare bird there so well I want to thank you for for listening. I uh, hope that this was informative and maybe a little bit entertaining. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain those as long as these guys have the Zoom. And um, yeah, well, what, what thank you very much, Dave. Thank you very much, Dave. That was really, really wonderful. And um, we actually have a few questions. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And for those of you who have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, so the first question um, is by Scott, who asked, the, the groove behind the eye of the MERS appears to be more than just a plumage streak. Does it have some biological function? Um, I, you know, I don't know if there's a biological function to that, but a lot of the MERS do show that groove behind the eye and there's actually some that are like the bridled common MERS where that's actually got like a white mark in breeding season but you know there is that kind of separation in the feathers there it's it's a good question I I'm not aware off the top of my head if there's a biological significance to that but it may just be where sort of the break oh you know with the auriculars there on the side of the head got it okay great thanks um Henry asks I may have missed it, but what's the one else that you haven't seen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Japanese merlet. And, and I have to say that that photo I showed early in the talk of the ancient merlet with the two chicks, if I would have just kept my mouth shut, everyone on our ship would have counted that as Japanese merlet. The two leaders screamed out pair of Japanese merlets on the water. It was the one day in Southern Russia where we were within the range, right? And people are high-fiving and going crazy because that's a very rare alcid. And I walked up with the back of my camera and I said, they're ancient merlets. They're not Japanese. And those guys fought me on it. And, and finally I won them over. I said, look, there's no one on this boat that wants those to be Japanese merlets more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> they're not japanese merlets but right now my boss is actually on a year assignment in japan and so i'm trying to get him to find a way to um, get me over there to see some japanese merlets we're still we're still working on that <laughs> fantastic great um so someone asks uh anonymous attendee asks uh where can we learn about signups for pelagic trips Good question. Um, 
the trips that we run out of Ventura are on Island Packers and they are on their website. They have like a birding excursion tab under their special trips. And we have, we have two long distance or 12 hour trips, one August 5th, I believe, one September 30th. Uh, we're also going to be trying to schedule some shorter trips to go to Santa Barbara Island to see the booby colony and the travel from Ventura to Santa Barbara Island down the Pilgrim Banks is a good spot, especially in the fall for Carreri's Merlat, and it's good for Merlats in general. So we're, you know, there's trips there. The trips, boy, my Orange County trips sell out by the second I announce them. I have like these Orange County groupies that fill those trips really fast, but that would be on the Dana Wharf uh, website. And then the San Diego trips that are run by Paul Lehman and Dave Povey and those guys, there's a San Diego Pelagic website. So yeah, there's there's those as well as the LA birder trips that are run here in LA. So for the Southern California trips, that's about the extent now. Um, we do have a Facebook page that I don't do a good job of <laughs> keeping up to date with announcements because no one likes our stuff. So it's been frustrating, but. Uh, yeah, see and Sage does their quarterly oh, trips too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And C and Sage does those trips at Orange County and they tend to, those trips are pretty good. They have a lot of success on those. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, Yvonne asks, uh, can one reliably age puffins by the vertical lines or plates of the bill? Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, certainly, well, you know, the adult birds in breeding plumage are, are pretty clear. I think non-breeding birds, it's probably a little trickier i mean you may be able to tell juveniles i think the juveniles and tufted puffins may have a slightly smaller bill and and a little more blackish on the head um you know and same could probably be said for horn puffins probably be a little darker on the face and the bill a little smaller but yeah that's that's a tricky one and again i didn't want to get too deep in the weeds on trying to make some of those <laughs> fine distinctions because you know we'd be we'd be missing more basketball games and peaceful protests than we really are tonight, so. Uh, oh, and to clarify, Yvonne says, uh, man, you, can you tell if an adult, you know, how old an adult is once they're adult plumage? Um, if they're, you know, second year, third, fourth, fifth. Um, I don't really know that you can. Steve Howell might be able to do that. You know, there are times where I've, said some bird is an adult to Steve and, you know, not puffins necessarily, but I remember seeing a tropic bird in the Atlantic and I was like, oh, it's great that that white-tailed tropic bird was an adult. And he's like, well, that one had that one dark feather on the wing, which means it's a third year bird, right? So Steve yeah. Howell might be able to tell, I, I don't know that, you know, mortals could, could do that, but. <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Um, and Yvonne also asks, any generalizations you can make about molt strategies of the three different groups of alcids? I didn't notice any missing feathers in your photos. Oh, yeah. I, well, again, the, the molt stuff, I mean, the information's out there. I, I, I can't honestly give you some of that off the top of my head. But uh, yeah, we don't, we generally don't see alcids in heavy molt. Like, like we do with shearwaters. When shearwaters show up here in the spring and some of these cities and pink foots, they're so heavily molting off those flight feathers and, and look really rickety. But with the alcids, I mean, we do see these worn birds later in the season where some of these birds can get more browner in appearance. But, um, you know, and I'll even leave John to provide input on this if he wants to, but I, I, I don't generally recollect alcids being in heavy mold occasionally some of these wintering ones is some of the rhinos and, and puffins especially can have pretty raggedy looking wings as they wear later in the season but i think we get um the and i, I the, some the species escapes me but i think some of the bigger ones uh they go out to sea and become flightless briefly um but right after like right after breeding and they're out to sea away from gulls and things like that so we just we just don't see them when they're like that yeah mm -hmm. excellent great um 
And um, Yvonne also asks, oh, this is about, about aging the puffins again from the plate number, I guess the number of plates on the bill. I, I, I'm wondering if you could age them by that. I don't think so. I don't think it's like rings on a tree or something, but. Okay. Uh, yeah. Great, thanks. Um, we would love to see some of those breeding ones down here, but uh, yes, <laughs> don't don't generally see them like that down here. Um, Will asks, I believe Atlantic puffins are being forced to look further for food as an indirect result of global warming. Can you mention the effect of on on acids off of California of climate change? Well. Yeah, I mean, certainly in the Pacific, the blob had a huge effect on alcids, especially off Alaska a few years ago. And they think even in the case of common MERS, that maybe a quarter of the population might have perished in the blob. Oh, wow. In huge numbers wow. of, of birds. And there was also, I remember a few years ago, a big die-off of tufted puffins in Alaska. And I think some of these climate change concerns have sort of raised enough of an alarm and a flag that the Fish and Wildlife Service is actually examining whether it should list the tufted puffin as threatened or endangered right now and they're going through that process but mm. these big heat waves these ocean heat waves are affecting these birds pretty dramatically and there's been huge die-offs of MERS and Cassin's auklets tufted puffins I believe even horn puffins too so yeah, the, the you know climate change impacts to these species can be really pronounced, and it may even be why we're starting to see more Carveri's merlets up here. I mean, I I like to think we're getting out more and we're finding areas that tend to be sweet spots for those species, but you know, other people will you know counter that by saying they think it could be warming oceans are just pushing them up here because there were years I want to say in the no, well, maybe in the late 90s, early 2000s, we kind of would go years without seeing a Carreri's Merlet. There was a while where they were really tough to get. I have a friend who lives up in Santa Cruz, or he did, now I think he lives in Arizona, but, you know, he was a big time lister, and it took him forever to get a Carreri's Merlet, which he did off on one of our Ventura trips, but, you know, now we go out in the fall and see a numbers of Carreri's, I mean, see 70, 80 a day sometimes, but maybe that's aligned with why we're seeing boobies mm -hmm. nesting up here and, and other yeah. crazy things that are going on. And while we find the boobies to be exciting, there's something, Go something on. not right going on there. And, and, you know, we should temper our, you know, listing excitement with <laughs> some degree of peril for these birds. And then it's part of even, you know, I wasn't going to talk much about the work I do and I didn't put a lot of, I didn't put any really work related slides in though. I thought about doing it, but, um, you know, I'm working on these offshore wind projects and, you know, we have to at some point start balancing our need for carbon free energy versus what potential impacts are to birds. Right. And, and that's one of the things, you know, we're looking at very carefully and we've actually come up with some vulnerability assessments for all seabirds, including alcids and how vulnerable they are to offshore wind. I actually think with alcids, they're more vulnerable to being displaced than to being struck by blades, right? So it's not that we're going to kill a bunch of puffins because we probably won't, but we could displace them from areas. And that's something that we're considering very carefully, right? But, but all these things need to be balanced with where we get our energy from. And I'm always surprised that a lot of the bird groups are so dead set against like wind energy but, you know, birds are dying in larger numbers from conventional energy production, oil and gas. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and our, our own forecast doesn't look very good, right, till we break our reliance on, on carbon energy sources. So, yeah, but, but puffins are, and other alcids are certainly getting caught up in that. So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, great. Uh, Yvonne asks, do offshore wind turbines cause more turbidity in the surface water when operating? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, there are certain vibration effects that we're going to be considering, um, especially as it relates to marine mammals and, and other underwater species. 
Um, the turbines out here that are in the planning process, nothing's close to happening, but people are starting to, to consider that would be like these big floating platforms that are tethered to the bottom where one's off the East Coast and the Atlantic would be monopile construction being driven into the seafloor. And so it could be affecting uh, the ocean in, in different ways um, with vibration and other stuff like that. But uh, yeah, so far in Europe, and there's a lot of in, installed offshore wind in Europe, I don't know that that has been a, a big issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I think we're questions? running out of questions. I think so. Dave, that was a lot a... of thank yous though in the chat. Yes, <laughs> lots of thank yous, lots of appreciation. I can feel it coming through my camera right now. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. You. Yeah, and come yeah. on pelagic trips, people. You know, we're yeah. One if you know if you haven't, I know I saw some of the names and some of you are, you know, the the folks that are out there all the time, but you know, others. If at least if you're not prone to seasickness and you want to try <laughs> something different, you know, there's some folks, in fact, a few of the folks I saw on this list that will tell you, right, that I recommended they go on a pelagic trip and they'd never done it. And after that first trip, Turley's, um, you know, they're on <laughs> every every boat since then, right? So it's and and you know, and you guys, Mark and John, you'll attest to this too, right? That you know, pelagic birding's like the last frontier, right? And that yeah. We, yeah. Or just always finding new things and and learning new stuff and and identifying better where some of these things occur. Like now, finding that all the Guadalupe merlets are further offshore if you go look for them, and the Cavaries like other different spots. Right, and as every time we go, we're learning stuff that makes the next trips we run hopefully better. Right, uh, so mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, glad to trips, and I say that as someone who makes no money off the trips right like we're <laughs> volunteers so i i don't make a penny on them so i'm not saying this so you know i can get a new lens or something it's all when john and i go out and run these trips you know it's for the love of the game right and yep. um, and we just hope that if we uh, you know sort of build that field of dreams out there in the ocean you all come out and <laughs> participate in that Yep. Kevin, Kevin Costner's a Ventura guy, so I can make that reference. So. <laughs> well, uh, again, thank you very much. It was a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, check out, we just ran a short pelagic a uh, couple of weekends ago, and we'll have more coming up soon, John, I think. I, th I think the next one we're talking about June sometime. Yeah, mid mid June. Yeah. I think that's our, that'll be our next one. Mm -hmm. So members of Los Angeles Birders will receive an email with a link to sign up and inevitably they get filled by the members only. So we never actually get a chance to open them up to the general public. So if you want to check out the LA Birders um, Pelagics, please join. It's not expensive and we appreciate your support. And with that, thank you again, Dave. I It was yeah, thanks, absolutely. It was absolutely wonderful. And with that, I will see uh we'll see you all next month for our webinars. And mm -hmm. until then, have good birding and get out on the ocean. <laughs> Sounds great. Yep. Take care, everyone. Good night. Thanks. Yep, thank good night. You. Good night.